We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. Are As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast. For insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The eagle has landed. Hey, also the new year is starting and, um, you know, one of the recurring themes, uh, in my writing and maybe on this podcast every once in a while is the issue of fortitude, the issue of overcoming adversity, um, having some perspective in life. And, uh, every once in a while, I also give you some insight on what it's like to, to, (laughs) to go blind temporarily, um, or, or, or live with, you know, some kind of condition and, um, I came across a guy on uh, Instagram named uh, Jake Olson, and uh, his his story is just uh, fascinating. And I thought Jake would make a really great guest um, to talk about this, and especially maybe inspire some of you out there. Um, you're starting the new year, you know, you're making promises to yourself, but maybe one of those promises is is simply get over the challenge that has long haunted you. Um, and and what better way to do that than to, you know, gain some perspective in life and what better way to do that than to to look at somebody who's really overcome some really hard stuff. Um, so Jake is a a really interesting guy. So Jake, first of all, thanks for being on. And, um, I'll say a little bit about your bio real quick. Uh, you're born in 1997. Your first battle with cancer came at eight months old. Uh, you're diagnosed with, uh, retinoblastoma. Um, two months later, the disease claimed your left eye. November of 2009, after battling cancer for 12 years, Jake lost his right eye. Um, this is, you know, and, but, but then what's crazy is, and the reason I came across you online is because you have like a, a really like great sense of humor about blindness. Um, like it's, you know, it, it would make a lot of people like uncomfortable to watch, but I'm like, oh, I think it's hilarious. Um, and uh, uh, you were also a division one football player for USC, the Trojans. And so- Yo. Um, I actually did my freshman year at USC. I did not uh, know that. Yeah, you didn't know that. Yeah, I was. I'll, I'll tell you. We'll, we'll get into that. But um, uh, it's uh. So I was like, you know, I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure me and Jake could could have like a fun conversation, a fun like inspirational conversation. Did you Did you get kicked out or what? What's what like? Yeah. <laughs> <tell me? laughs> no. So you know, I kind of. I guess we'll have that conversation now. So I guess I. Uh, you know, so I went to high school in Bogota, Colombia. Like okay. my high school, my 20 year reunion was like this December. Um, at, at the time that we post this podcast, I will have gone to my high school reunion. Um, okay. okay. And I was down there because uh, my dad works in the oil and gas business. We're from Houston. So my whole life, I was like coming in and out of Houston, overseas, Houston, overseas, Houston. That, that's my life. And I didn't. So my parents went met at Texas A&M. And I, so as a teenager, I'm like, I'm not applying to Texas a because my parents met there and I can't go with my parents. But that was as dumb as that reasoning was. I very much, <laughs> I very much regret that. Like, uh, I would have such a great network. If yeah, I College just, Station is special. It's a great place, man. And the network is amazing for Texans, especially. So um, so I really want to go to the Naval Academy because all I ever wanted to do was be a SEAL. Right. And um, so I was like, OK, Naval Academy. Didn't get into the Naval Academy. Um uh, kind of ended up at USC, right? So uh, just based on like where my scholarship with ROTC would work best. And I actually loved USC. I just, I was not a huge fan of South Central Los Angeles. Sure. Um, and like, <laughs> sure. and, and, you know, and, and uh, I mean, you, you were on the football team, so you have like a friends group, but like, it's either that or you join a fraternity at USC. There's right. not like a college life really. Right. Right. At least, um, at least not when I was there, you know, in 2002. Uh, no, so, same. Yeah. So, I mean, it just, so I transferred, um, I wasn't kicked out, wasn't kicked out, but I transferred and ended up at Tufts. <laughs> I have a weird, I just have like a really kind of uninspiring college history. <laughs> I'll just, I'll just say it. Well, um, I mean, right. Los Angeles isn't too far away from Coronado though. So, I mean, you were, you were, you were close. Yeah, I was close and, and, you know, I was close to my, my grandparents retired and I just outside of San Diego, just got to see them a little bit more, but I obviously saw them a lot more when I was stationed in San Diego. So, right. I mean, I got nothing against San Diego. Now, that's a totally different story than South Central Los Angeles. That is a very different place. <laughs> very different. Where, where are you from originally? So I'm from Orange County. So okay. Huntington, California also, is- also very different from South Central. It's way nicer. <laughs> yes, it is. 30 miles is, it goes a long way in California. That's for sure. Okay, so let's just kind of start at the beginning. Um, 
you know, I'm not going to ask you to, to retell your story at eight months old. I doubt you remember much of that. Um, so, so, you know, so part of this conversation is like, kind of, you, you know, you give, you give public speeches like over a hundred, I think at this point, you have a small business that, that does public speaking. You, you, yep. you give inspirational speeches. So we'll kind of get to some of that, but let's just start with the story. I mean, I assume you don't remember what it's like to lose an eye at eight months old. Maybe you do, but you, you really do know how it is to grow up with one eye. And so, I mean, how is that? yeah. So, you know, like you said, I, I don't remember getting diagnosed with cancer. I don't remember losing my left eye. Um, but, you know, growing up, I remember the first time I kind of recognized maybe something was different because even with my right eye, um, you know, I, I wore glasses. It wasn't always the best eyesight. But as a kid, you don't know any different. You know, you kind of assume everyone just has what you have. And so I remember I have a twin sister named Emma. And when we go to uh, the ocularist, you know, where, where you get your fake eyes, um, I remember she would be sitting there in the room and I'd kind of get my, you know, left eye taken out, they, you know, polish it, you know, as I grew up, you know, they would have to resize it or whatever. And she would be like, when are they going to take out my eye next? You know, <laughs> because as little, as little kids, you don't really ever think, you know, this isn't how life goes. Um, but I do remember when that cancer came back in my right eye. So we beat it when I was a baby, uh, it stayed away for a few years. And then it came back when I was in kindergarten. So right around about five years old. Um, and, I remember leaving my actually kindergarten and graduation with my mom and in the parking lot of, the, of my school, I remember her crying and I remember asking her, you know, Hey mom, like, why are you crying? What's going on? And she just, I remember her just saying something of, of the nature, like, this isn't fair. It's just not fair. And I really didn't know what she meant, but you know, sure enough, we were going to the hospital and start receiving chemo again. Um, and that kind of, you know, started putting the thought in my head of, Hey, maybe this isn't what every kid has to do. Um, and so pretty much from there on, you know, we went through chemo when I was five and, and, and the cancer did go away again. And then this time it only stayed away for about a year or so. And then it came back and then we had to go through more treatment and radiation. And so that really became just what I knew as a child growing up, just going up to CHLA, um, receiving all these different treatments, sometimes even flying to uh, to New York for experimental treatment at the time, which was intra-arterial chemotherapy. I mean, we threw everything we had at it. And again, growing up with my right eye, depending on what we we're doing treatment wise, had better eyesight than other times, but still went to school, you know, looked at the whiteboard and piece of paper with my right eye, played the sports I loved with my right eye. You know, my peripheral vision obviously wasn't the best, um, but it definitely was, um, I made it work. You know, I was, I was actually really quite um, normal and, and didn't really, maybe because I just never had eyesight with my left eye, just my brain developed a, a really good way to to survive and, and thrive with my right eye. Um, and so by the time I was 12 years old, um, that cancer came back for its eighth time in my right eye. And uh, this was the fall of 2009. The doctors at this point had a different message for me than the previous seven times, which was, we can't treat this anymore. And the, and the fear with retinoblastoma, since it exists in the retina of the eye, it can move from the retina through the optic nerve into the brain. And at that point, um, it will take the child's life. And so really what you're doing by treating the cancer is yes, you're hoping it cures it, but you're all also rolling the dice, right? You're rolling the dice, hopefully hoping that this thing doesn't spread while you're kind of, you know, quote unquote, messing around with it. Um, so by the time it came back that eighth time, they just said, Hey, we can't do any more chemo. Like you, you've literally had a lifetime max with this, with, with these harsh chemo drugs. We can't do any more radiation. Like you had a lifetime max on radiation. These other localized treatments we've done, you know, they might, it might impact the cancer. It's not going to cure it. All we're going to do is wait for the day that you come in here and us tell you that it's spread and it's going to take your life. So once again, that last option, um, which is, you know, it does remove the cancer. It does cure you of the cancer, but it's the last option is obviously removing that eye. And so at the age of 12, they had to take my right eye, uh, meaning obviously I went completely blind. Yeah, it's wild. I mean, I kind of want to start, let's start before that, um, you know, because I get asked all the time, like, how do you, how do you do all these things with one eye? And I'm like, like, what's it like? And I'm like, I don't know. I mean, just cover your right eye. Just cover it <laughs> and you'll know. <laughs> like, it's like the, uh, it's the, um, and they're like, oh yeah, they feel kind of silly. It's like, uh, it's one of the first Avengers movies. Um, and Tony Stark is like up on this like big, like airship and, uh, and, and Nick Fury is like walking around and, right. and Tony Stark is like, how does he see this, this everything? And it's and, and like one of his assistants, one of Nick Fury's assistants is just like, he, he turns 
<laughs> like, what's well, like, it's not like this big mystery. Um, like, how do you drive? I'm like, I, I just drive. It's not, it's, it's not this, um, again, it's not a big mystery. And you know, what's funny. You actually, you actually kind of sound like Robert Downey Jr. A little bit. <laughs> I can, maybe I'm, maybe I'm just, uh, channeling him a little bit. Um, <laughs> But it's just like, you know, it, you just got to adapt and overcome. And I'm, I'm, I'm similar to you. Like my left eye is really screwed up. I, I'm aphakic. I, have a, I, don't, I don't have a lens in it. Um, before this podcast, I was like, you know, some, it's on some days it's just really irritable and getting a big well, is contact that, in there. I mean, Does that screw you up more though? That like you you have some side in it. So it kind of just really, you know, the, the differential between the two kind of like screws with your mind a little bit. No, 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 no. So I know my right eye is gone, gone. Okay, like, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. Totally okay, gone. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. I just mean my one eye that I do have is also all messed up. Okay. Um, but okay. that, but that is a problem I hear from a lot of people, right? Because they're like, "Oh, I'm blind in one eye," and I'm like, "Okay, well, what do you mean by that?" And it, it usually means like well, it kind of works, not so much. And they they seem to have way bigger problems adapting yeah. to basic stuff than I'm like, just get rid of it. You know, you don't need it. Um, <laughs> you have two. Yeah. That's the problem. Um, well, I, I mean, <laughs> I can wear a cool eye patch or a glass eye, like whatever. I've met people who kind of have the one eye and for some reason, like their depth perception and everything else is really screwed up. And, and when I had one eye, I mean, I didn't think it was that bad. Like I, I was pretty good at, at, you know, playing sports, you know, tracking down a football yeah. or basketball or like hitting a golf ball. I mean, like it, it was, you know, I don't know, I guess I never know what it would like to have two eyes and do that stuff. But for me, like, it wasn't like Definitely I was, easier. you know, walking <laughs> in the walls. <laughs> like, yeah. No, I don't, I yeah, and I tend to think maybe they weren't going to be good at that kind of stuff anyway. Um, you know, it would be hard for me to learn. Like, like so, so I don't know how good at you are at like tennis. Okay. Like tennis would be difficult now for me. Um, okay. I haven't really tried it all that much. I probably I could probably kind of do it. Um, you know, soccer. I, like, so I grew up playing soccer, so I'm okay at it. But it's still definitely more difficult for me. It's difficult for me to track the ball. I also have terrible like glare problems, so glare is an issue um what about like eating in dark restaurants that was always hard for me like with my right eye just like it, it like anytime there was like a low lit like area it just kind of it really made things a lot more difficult uh, definitely but 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 i don't know if that's a one eye thing for me i that's i think that's just a, a bad eye thing for me right? because <laughs> okay. so, because my, my pupil doesn't dilate like i my iris is is smashed like broken you can right. see it if, if it, like if you look at my iris it's not a circle it's like a there's, there's an obvious cut in it and okay. I've just never, I just don't want to do excessive surgeries on my eye. If I can adapt. Okay. Without the surgeries, that's generally the, how we've thought about this. Um, right. so I have terrible glare and therefore night vision. So yes, but I'm not sure I, what I tell people too, is like depth perception affects you at about six feet, six to eight feet because beyond, beyond six to eight feet, your eyes converge anyway, and you shouldn't have any issues with depth perception. Right. And then there's other ways to gain depth perception, um, like moving your head. Like, right. so, so I've learned to like move and this is, you probably just did this naturally growing up playing sports and, and because you played sports, you probably learned to do it very, very well. Cause a lot of people have problems with really what I would think are very basic things. But if you, if you practice it, like, like I have a problem catching a small object, it's very difficult. But if I, if I kind of sit there and throw a ball against the wall for a little bit and then I, and I just have to move my head like to the left or the right so that I create my own, um, visual, um, like, like that, what's the, what's, there's a term for this, but I'm kind of forgetting it. But what I'm doing is I'm, I'm creating my own visual cues. Whereas a normal person with two eyes has those, they don't, they don't need to do that because they have actual depth perception. Right. People with one, I have to just create a different visual cue. So you have to do, and that's just movement. Well, interesting. Um, I probably did do that just naturally, not even realize it. Just do it naturally. Yeah. You're like moving your head differently. Um, you're just looking at things differently. Like well, one problem I have sometimes is like, if I want to jump up on a pull-up bar, like that can be a, cause that's like, that's like right at that moment. I mean, I usually don't miss it, but there's a, it's always a risk. <laughs> it's, it's always a risk. Um, <laughs> the, the other like classic example, I always like under, under, um, I, I, I always cut short like a handshake too. And you end up with this really like dainty handshake, but I have to like redo it. I'm like, no, don't, don't like, don't do that. Like we got to redo that. Cause I like give them just my fingertips. You know, right. so it's like, yeah, no, you're I'm not like, a dainty maiden. Well, I, I just, I put my hand out there and hopefully I, I, I hit another hand and I don't go past that. Cause it's right, right at that waist level. You know, I don't want to be uh, yep. 
Yeah. Be <laughs> familiar with someone real quick, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, at least they don't explore well, the problem with, in, in my case is like people, I don't act like I have a visual impairment. I mean, one of the reasons I wear an eye patch as a public figure is to help people understand that like right. I can't see them. I can't see right. them on that side because people wave to me. They'll do things and they'll, then they'll be offended that I don't do it back. Right. You know, right. I, I leave people hanging on handshakes all the time because they sure. put their hand out very low. And like, I just don't have, I just don't have that kind of perception. And right. so like <laughs> my wife's gotten very used to telling me like handshake, handshake, handshake. Yeah, right, right, people right. They're just constantly doing it to me and I, I can't see it. I'm like, come on, man, put it in front of my face. Like it's the only way I can see you. It's the reason I wear the iPads. <laughs> like it's, it's to help you understand what I, what I'm dealing with. Um, oh, one, one question I would ask you, like, so you were talking about prosthetic eyes. Do you have any, do, do you have any, um, like, like, do you have like a Trojan eye? Do you, or do you only have like a normal eye? <laughs> No, I have never done the whole special. Um, I've I've heard of stories. I've always kind of joked like around Halloween time, like what I always ask people, what would be more scary? Like if if like I lift up my glasses and all you saw was like straight like black eyes or straight just white eyes. Like what do you what do you think would be more scary? <laughs> what do I think? Um yeah. probably Probably black. I don't know. I've got such an imagination for this stuff. I mean, one white, one black, you know, you could do. How about just like neon green? I have actually, so I have a one that's neon green. That would be like creepy. Just, just that would be creepy. Green. It's shocking to people. <laughs> yeah, that would actually be, I, I, I see, I didn't think about that. I Like, I think black, like straight black guys. I think like if, if like, I always thought like if people were, you know, like, I don't know, you, you run into a, a you know, JA or whatever, like down the street, like, the, oh, someone's like mouthing off. Like all you do is lift up your glasses real quick. And like, all they see is like this person staring at them with straight black. Like that would put that person in their place real quick. <laughs> Have you, you would think so. <laughs> it's like, so basically like my, uh, my, if uh, I have like 12, I have like 12 different, different eyes. Um, I don't generally I wear what I, I got to get on your level. I, I have yeah. not, I have you not done to. this. Yeah, I can't believe you haven't done it. You got to I mean, I will say, you know, I, I don't know what what your like local ocularists will will do for you. Um this is definitely a military thing. So like every guy in the military that loses an eye, of course there's quite a few. Um like it's just it's just it just got to be a normal part of the the one eye culture or 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 maybe both eyes it was like, "No, I want I want some crazy shit in my eye." Like I want, and so like my, my, my fake eyes are, I have a lot of black ones, but like, you know, they'll have like the gold seal trident symbol in, in the middle of it. Oh, um, oh, I've got like dope. a Captain America one. I've got like American flag. I've got a Houston Astros. I, I was, I was, I was bringing that out a lot for the world series. Um, you know, they're just you did, like you, the, the, but, but like the military doctors do it. And so, um, and they like doing it because it helps them train their new people on, on how to make eyes. So it, like it, it's there's there's a system in place. I've never I've never gotten one out in the private sector. So I don't I don't know what that system is like, but totally worth it. Have you have you seen this or heard of this guy um, online? I reached out to him and he was like, well, I'm not really there yet. But I was like, hey, can I get one of these? And it was like he had figured out how to do these um, these fake eyes, but with like LED lights in them. No way. They're like straight up cyborg guys. Yeah. He's got a big following on social media. It's pretty intense. Yeah, I think I think I think we need to have a separate conversation. You gotta you gotta hook me up with with these ocularis. I, I think I, I, there's a new world out there that I need to get into. Yeah, yeah. I, I will try. I will try. Yeah, it, it, it'll it'll change your life. Um <laughs> it's just it's just more it just makes it more fun. Yeah. Um, I, I was no, like I, if I got a like interlocked SC, like the SC logo, like on it on the people, that that'd be dope. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right. So, so that's the one eyed life. Um, but you know, and, and we can have a lot of fun about the one eyed life, but you know, it's a little different when you lose that one eye. And, um, and so, and you're 12 years old when this happens. I was, yeah, I was 12. And so what is, I mean, how do you initially deal with that as a, as a 12 year old? And like, what, you know, what advice do you give adults when they're, when they have to deal with something? Yeah, well, the emotions that first came through, um, one, when I heard it was just uh, this disbelief. You know, I, I lived my whole life thinking every time this cancer was back that, hey, we, you know, let's just keep fighting. Like, let's just fight. You know, we got the, these options. We'll just, you know, yeah, chemo sucks and all this stuff. But just like, we'll just keep fighting. Um, and to be told that that wasn't an option anymore was was devastating just because of 
how much we just went through, right? Like my entire childhood was hopefully being this cancer. So I'd be told at the end of the day, ah, no, this thing's going to take your eyesight anyway. So it was, it was really frustrating. Um, I was sad. You know, I remember thinking just, oh my gosh, you know, I, I won't be able to see my parents' faces anymore. I won't be able to see this. I won't be able to see that. And then I started thinking, well, shoot, you know, I'm only 12. Like I have a whole life to come. Like I, I won't be able to see, you know, like girls in high school or what my future wife looks like or my future kids, you know, growing up in, in Orange County, you know, what, 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 what sunset, like just all these things I like looking at, wanting to see in the future, like all these things just that I wouldn't be able to. I mean, it, it really started tormenting my mind of just everything I would miss. Um, and then I was scared because, you know, we just kind of talked about using your right eye. I mean, you do have vision. So to think of a world where I was going to have to, you know, relearn how to read and write by learning Braille. Um, you know, I was a straight A student in middle school. How's that going to be? You know, am I going to have to miss out? Am I going to have to, you know, um, skip, skip, you know, a couple of years and, and hang back? Like I, what, what's, what's my life going to look like just from an everyday of knowing when water is full in my cup or when food's on my fork or what I'm wearing, you know, like all these things that you, you just kind of like take for granted that you use your eyes for just, it, it literally flips your, your life on the head, uh, on its head. So like, that really was what were the emotions that that were overcoming me um, again, frustration, sadness, fear of the uncertainty to come. But a lot of people said, hey, you know what? And you know, how did you get through that? Like you just asked. I mean, you're well, only 12. Yeah, right. But I was a 12 year old who had just battled cancer for 12 years. Yeah. Um, and that's in that same mindset. So, I, you know, I was battle tested and that same mindset that I took every time that cancer came back, all those times of, of uh, adversity in, in the hospital room of throwing up because of chemo or just, you know, things not going my way because I had to be home sick from school and not be around other people or, just, you know, my life really wasn't normal. And so but the mindset I took during that of just overcoming that um, in, in, in choosing to to push through and fight, I built that habit up so that really the options were still there. When I lost my side of, hey, am I going to go home and let blindness ruin my life? Am I going to forfeit my hopes and dreams and just you know, let people feel sorry for me? Yeah, that option was there, but the other option was still there. And that's the option I made a habit of choosing, which was, no, I'm going to fight through this. I don't know how, but I, I know I can control what I can control. And that's the will to fight. I'm going to have a will to, to succeed. I'm going to have a will to see my future and, and, and have a vision for my future still and, and not forfeit all my hopes and dreams and, and you know not make the decision and daily decision that blindness isn't going to rob me of my happiness or the things I love doing. Uh, I had no idea what that looked like. Again, I had no idea how I was going to go to school. I had no idea how I was going to continue to play the sports I love. I had no idea how I was going to continue to hang out with my friends and play video games and all that stuff. But I, you know, I had the will and my personal definition of resilience is if there's a will, there's a way. And what I always say is that people kind of get that mixed up sometimes. But again, we walk by faith, not by sight. And the thing is that people, when they can't see a way, they forfeit on the will uh, instead of knowing that, hey, the only thing that's really up to me is, is first determining the will to want to, to move past that adversity, the will to overcome. And then that way starts revealing itself. And it really is a special thing when that happens. And most times, if not all times, really special about finding that way is that you do it with a community and a support system. Well, yeah. And, you know, I actually uh, wanted to ask about that. Um, you know, how important was that support system? Were you able to quickly get in touch with um, other blind people that kind of understand it, get it, especially blind people who went blind. Right. And, and I'm curious right. in the blind community, like what's the difference between those who lost their sight after seeing for, you know, a number of years seeing normally and maybe lose your sight traumatically or be a cancer. Like I definitely know guys in the military just lost their sight all of a sudden. Right. And then there's people who were born that way. Um, you know, and, and, and what, what is that community like and how helpful was that? Yeah. I think there's, there's things you have to learn if you've never seen, you know, I think there's just, you know, social cues and some stuff that, you know, I've witnessed with, you know, with blind dudes who, who've never seen that um, is different. Um, but yeah, definitely people who have lost their, you know, eyesight over time, or, you know, like I said, have one scene, um, those guys really stepped in, kind of showed me how to, you know, orientational ability, get around with the cane, um, use your ears in different ways to kind of help orient yourself, you know, or people helping with technology, you know, yeah. teaching me how to, how to use uh, different computers with software, iPhone with software. So like that was very helpful, but it really was just the people around me who, you know, my, my family, my friends, um, teachers, you know, who just stepped up to the plate and just said, Hey, again, 
where we see Jake, you have this will to want to continue to live the life that you were living beforehand. We're going to help you find the way. So again, if it's a teacher who's taken extra time to teach me through tactile, like math and figuring out equations on, on uh, pieces of paper and like, and, and boards that magnetic little boards that have braille pieces that I can move around. If it's my dad out there lining up my golf club, um, helping me learn golf. If it's my teammates, again, when I went to high school and college, you know, taking the extra time to say, okay, Jake can snap the ball, but he can't just go run up to the ball, line himself up. So the holder, you know, takes my, runs me up there, lines me up, takes my hips. I take my stance. He kind of tells me, you know, move your left foot up one inch, whatever. Again, this different, it's not the ordinary way everyone else does it, but guess what? It's, it's a way to do it. And I think, you know, you've learned and I've learned, in life that a lot of times when you're facing adversity or when you're going through stuff um it's going to change things it's going to cause you to have to do things a different way but that does not mean there's not a way and i think a lot of times people just hey i, I can't do it like he's doing i can't do it like it's been done in the past well i just can't do it it's like that's not true um there's there's always a, a way as long as there's a will yeah no it's important i mean and the community is important too for just that somebody's got to be able to give you hope right like that that there's a that there's a way to live a normal life, even with this, what seems like a, a very extreme disability. Um, right. As far as losing your senses go, obviously a guy like me has thought about this quite a bit. I think about going blind quite a bit uh, for good reason. I went blind right. um, a year and a half ago. I mean, I was, I, I lost my retina detached and my one eye and it was like, holy shit. I mean, this was, this is it. Um and so, yeah, it's something I think about, but as far as senses go, it's like, well, if you had to lose a sense, which one would it be? The sight would probably be the last one you pick. Um, yeah. And it's, it's tough. And then, so you got to know that people have done this before you and that they've succeeded. You know, one of the sort of, when, when I give like a fortitude talk, I'm always, I always bring up the, the, the following statement, which is, you know, whatever you're going through right now, you might've been through something harder so you can deal with whatever you're going through now. But if you haven't been through something harder, if this is truly the hardest thing and, you know, say you're losing your second eye at age 12, that's probably the hardest thing up, up until that moment. You can guarantee you this. Somebody else has been through a moment like that and they dealt with it a lot better than you're dealing with it now. And like that, that's I think that that's kind of like a tough love statement to make to somebody. Sure. But it's like <laughs> anybody who's going through something hard, I mean, you can absolutely point to somebody who has been through the same thing. And they just crushed it. And like, that shouldn't be like a, a knock on you. It shouldn't be a criticism. It should be inspiration. Yeah. This is kind of right. one of the reasons I wanted to bring you on and just to show people like what, how much, how, how much somebody can do even with this, with this, with this thing happening to them. It's just incredible. Yeah. And I, I mean, kind of probably goes back to your SEAL training too, where it's just, you know, you're, you're, you're pushing yourself and seeing other people, you know, have done this and that, that probably, you know, gives you some light at the end of the tunnel and those, right. those dog it, days. Are hundred percent, hundred percent. It's one of the, done. it's one of those instructors favorite things to yell at you about. They're like, but they don't say it very nicely, right? Their, their, their goal is not <laughs> to inspire you. Their goal is to like just to insult you, but it's like, why are you being such a, you know, yeah. blank? <laughs> the, uh, there are 10,000 guys who have done this before you. Why do you suck so bad? Like it's, you know, right. it kind of gets you taken. You're like, I do suck right now. I need to stop. I need to stop shivering like a little bee and just, just get after it. Um, and so no, I, no, yeah, it's, it's tough love, yeah. but it works. No. And I mean, and I think that's one of the reasons why I've, you know, taken the privilege and honor. So, so um, seriously about going in and same with you about sharing our story, you know, and, and, letting letting people know our story and know our mindset and know us as, as just human beings you know we're not we're not demigods we're not something special like we're we are just human beings um who struggle who have struggled but who have come out on the other side um and and it, it's not like i said it's not magic it's it's just uh, a, a willpower that's in my opinion is in all of us and it's really tapping into that and finding how to tap into that inside of you um and so like i think the fact that you know we can share stories um, to your point, it is really helpful to to those who who need um, a lesson or, or a, a place of inspiration to look towards. Oh, yeah, it totally is. I, I have some like very technical questions for you that honestly, it's like a guy like only a guy like me would really ask. Like kind of your fellow sort of visually impaired folks. Um, so I've been blind a couple times. Uh, right, right, like right when my accident first happened, accident, whatever you call it, getting blown up in the face in Afghanistan first happened. Sure. Um, I'm not sure it was an accident. It was clearly someone did it on purpose to me. <laughs> but um, yeah, 
uh, so that happened. Um, and I was blind for a while. And um, and then I was blind for a while again, uh, just a year and a half ago. Now, one of the things I noticed, I'm really curious about your experience at age 12 when when you lost when then when they, you know, you woke up from surgery and they had inoculate enucleated your eye and yep. it was gone. It's just all black at that point. Yep. My observation is an interest. I, I think this is interesting. My ability to sort of create images in my mind um, uh, just drastically increased. Yes. Like in a very strange way. Like I could, I could like create very detailed. If I was like, am I watching 4k right now? Like I could just create very detailed imaginary images in my head and, and like manipulate yeah. them in a way that yeah. I just can't when I'm just normally daydreaming with ice, when I have normal eyesight, it was right. it's very strange. The other thing that happened a lot, which was not so great, frankly, um, was my mind like kind of knows my, my apartment and it would start to create images. So I would be like, no, I can see the coffee table. I can see it, but I, but I, but it's not there. And, and also, but when my mind doesn't quite get it right either. So I think it's there. And then boom, I smack my knee on something else. Cause it wasn't actually there. Yeah, that's, that is so funny. So I, one of the stories I tell is, is like that happened a few days after I lost my eyesight. I call it like the phantom pain of going blind. Like your, your mind mm -hmm. thinks it can see it's so vivid. And I, I, tell people I walked into my door frame, just like straight up walked in, you know, hurt pretty bad. But like um, that, so that kind of vivid, that reality kind of goes away after a little while. It's not as vivid. Like you're, I guess your mind just kind of learns like you can't rely on that clearly. Yeah. Um, so it does, it does kind of go away after you haven't seen it for a while, but the ability to create, um, the ability to create, like you said, those images in your head. Yeah. Like a lot of people ask me, you know, is it just black? And it's like, no, it's not just black because, to see black is to see, right? Like if you walk in a dark room or if you yeah. look at black, whatever, like that's still, you're seeing black, black's a color. Yeah. Um, but to not have no sight, like it is just your mind's eye. And so you, you do create, you know, what you would be looking at. Now, I, I assumed I would do that a lot more. I assumed I would just every day, you know, walk in a room, what am I seeing? You know, what do I, what am I focused on? What, do I, what should I be seeing? And just try to picture everything. You know, the world is so, you know, there's so many other senses going on that, to be honest with you, man, like I don't, I don't really do that a ton. There's times I will, but there's not, there's not a lot of times I sit there and like, hey, what would I be seeing right now? Let me try to picture this. Like, there's just so many other senses that I'm focused on um, that I really, you know, kind of almost forget that I can't see because I'm just so focused on using my hearing or feeling or uh, spatial awareness or just whatever to kind of just be navigating and living life. Yeah, no, I and mean, that totally makes sense that you wouldn't make a habit out of it, but but you have the ability to, in in a yes. way that I don't think regular people understand. Yeah, well, and, and that's where people, you know, how do you how do you know where things are? Like, are you, it's like, dude, my mind can like pretty much like picture a three D map in my head, and I can like navigate that. You know, it's like it really, it, it it your brain builds an ability to kind of really picture again space and time, and kind of think, you know you kind of know where you are. Yeah, it's it's crazy, and and like you you people are like, well, how do, how does that happen? And I'm like, well, I, I like put some on some like blackout goggles for a few days and try it yeah you know i mean yeah. like there, there is a way to to understand <laughs> you know um it might it might be a little weird but it'll it'll it, it changes you it's a very different thing and, and when it first happened to me it was mostly in the like it felt more like hallucinations because i was in a ton of pain it was like a traumatic injury and i had a lot of drugs and i was like it was crazy and you know i'd fall asleep for you know i slept very little but i would I'd be dreaming and what was really terrifying was to wake up still in the dream, right. knowing I was not in the dream, but it's all I could see. And it was right. like, that was like, wow, you're like quite literally living in a nightmare. Um, so that's not so much fun, but the second time, you know, obviously it was just a go in, I had surgery, it came out and I was, you know, patched up for a while. So that's what, that's when the vividness came back and it was just, and I, and I was just, you know, again, I wasn't going through a trauma at that, even though I guess the retina detaching is a bit traumatic, but I wasn't going through a whole blowing up trauma. And so I could really focus on this, on this, just this, this interesting thing that happens um, when you lose sight. And I can, I can absolutely see what you're saying um, about how your mind just sort of makes it work. I guess yeah. my second technical question is like, you, you've seen, you've seen some cases where um, people will even start like clicking, they almost create like their own sonar. Sure. Um, yeah. So that? I was... I was trained by like the world, like these world famous guys, um, Brian uh, Bushway, I think is one of them, uh, his name. And then um, there's another guy, I forget, 
who's even Dan something, but um, Daniel Tish, I think is what his name is. Uh, but they, like they, these guys are ridiculous. I mean, they look like ride a bike three miles per hour and be clicking. And like, I, I don't, I don't do that. I don't really click and, and like use it the way they do, but because of like how bad my sight was growing up, like I did learn to use my ears to orient myself. So I could kind of hear when spaces would be closing down. I could hear when a, a wall would end and another, you know, hallway would open up. So like, I actually don't use a cane a lot in familiar spaces because I can just kind of hear when, where things are supposed to be. Um, you know, again, I know there's a, a, a hallway up to my right. I know when that, that space opens up because I'm listening for it. Um, so a lot of people freak out and actually think I'm faking being blind a lot of times because <laughs> like there'll be times where like I would be walking and like I'd, I'd feel like a branch ahead of me like you know and I'd kind of duck and like you know my friend dude I saw you duck you could see that it's like well I like no I just kind of heard that there was like a space kind of in front of my face that I was, that's you know, crazy like, you can hear a branch it just like it it, it feels like I, again if, if you did this for a day or two like if you move your if you close your eyes and just move your hand in front of your face you could kind of hear that sound change because like yeah. all of a sudden there's something in front of your face right yeah like everybody so, listening right now just closed their eyes and started waving in front of their face it, yeah well, you really got, <laughs> hopefully you got you're not in a public <laughs> spot while you're doing it <laughs> <laughs> yeah the way you're waiting for your airplane uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is working um but yeah you can hear it you can hear <laughs> space like you really can um and so like when i walk into a room i know how big the room is just because i can hear how the sound is in the room right like how big the room is where like and not like i'm not going to give you actual dimensions but i can tell you yeah this is a ballroom that probably know. sits 400 500 people or this is a conference room that sits 12 people wow that's that's that is really impressive and it's just just kind of get a sense for it now now are you like where do you stand on the spectrum of blind people I and mean, how many is that is that normally the case in most can most blind people i don't kind of figure that out no, I, unfortunately like a lot of blind people i met they they their orientation mobility is what we call it is bad uh like and that's yeah. where i think people kind of get the idea that like if you're blind you're kind of lost you don't know which way's up or down like and I, I don't know why I developed it. Maybe it's just because, like I said, I grew up with bad eyesight and it just kind of started developing over, over my youth and kind of when I would be able to see and then wouldn't be able to see so well or doing treatment and then would be able to see a little better. And I, I don't know, but my orientational ability is definitely probably on the, the high end of that spectrum. Is it, is it possible that it's simply because you believe you could? I don't know. I don't know, but I'll tell you, man, like if it weren't for that, like I wouldn't be playing division one football and sports I play. Like that's part of why I can do what I can do is because I, I just have a very really good way to orient myself. Yeah. Okay. And we actually haven't talked about that. So let's kind of, let's kind of end on that. I mean, and then you went on to play division one football for freaking USC, which, you know, it's not, I mean, it's no Tufts football team, but <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> hey, easy easy um <laughs> i don't even like, know what division tufts is it's not really a, a real thing <laughs> um but yeah so it's a pretty big deal so i mean how did, how did that even happen so you you, you i mean because you lose both eyes at age 12 then you play in high yeah. school you built the relationship up with usc when i was 12 uh, coach carol invited me just to kind of be an honorary member of that team that falls with my eyesight just to kind of these guys be around me and support me which was awesome um then obviously carol left kind of stayed in touch, but not too much with other coaches. Started playing high school ball my junior year, learned I could long snap, you know, just was part of the will to want to play this game I loved and, and not look back on high school regretting not playing, you know, high school ball. Then, sure enough, um, Coach Sarkeesian, um, who's at Texas now, um, was at SC. He saw me play, and I played at a pretty good high school out here, so there's always coaches watching us. He saw me play. And basically, you know, knew as SC guy, um, he asked me if I was wanted to come to SC. I said, yeah, that's where I you know, always wanted to go. He said, do you have the grades? And I said, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so I was planning on applying anyways. He goes, well, like, what's your relationship with the, the football program going to be when you're here? I'm like, I, I don't know. I didn't really think about that. He goes, well, I don't really see why you shouldn't snap on the team if you're here. Um, and I said, well, look, I don't see a reason either. Um, so at that point, um, there was no other way I was going to go to college. So I was able to, to walk on and, um, you know, worked uh, with the guys for two years and finally saw my first playing time my junior year. That's awesome. And, and, and kind of, you know, for, for non football players, like, ex explain how that position is possible. Explain like what that looked like when you, when yeah. you're on the field and what we you know 
So long snap means to, uh, like pretty much like the center. So you know how every time there's a play, the ball's hiked to the quarterback. Well, think about for a kicking play uh, for the punter or for the, the guy on the ground holding the ball for the kicker. Um, there needs to be a special person to snap the ball to that those individuals. Why? Because it needs to be faster. It needs to be cleaner. There's guys coming a little faster to come block it. So um, it's different than a normal center position. Um, so your job is just to get the ball back there as accurately and as fast as possible. Um, you don't have many blocking responsibilities. So, you know, not being able to see the guys in front of you aren't the biggest deal. It's somewhat protected um, as the rules of football have evolved. You can't really like what they call line up over the snappers. See, someone can't be right in front of you and just bulldoze you and you just run right into you. Um, but to be honest with you, a lot of guys don't want to do that anyway, because just think about it logically. You're trying to get to the back field. You're trying to get to the ball. Um, or that, that player as fast as you can, the quickest way is no contact, right? You want to slip through. Um, so a lot of times any contact you get is like guys trying to slip through and then the guards just kind of shove them into you. Um, but it's not, you know, it's so much, I, I tell people, it's like, that's not, you're not worried about that. Like it's, I, I, it's so different than being a tight end or receiver going over the middle and knowing there's a safety that has a running start at you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I mean, like, but you're not like afraid, but you're trying to block still if you can. Yeah, you're right. trying I mean, to be. A body. If you, you can be, you can sense people, and you're like, "Oh, screw you! You're not going anywhere." I yeah, mean, you're you can just, still do trying it. to be a body. Though. I do. I love contact. That was that was my favorite part. I I told people to hit me, man. I, I love that. Um, so yeah. again, it's not something I was ever worried about. And and so were you just? Um, I mean, were, did you almost have an advantage in this in that in that particular snapping position because because you can't see? is your muscle memory and just ability to get it right every time just better than somebody who's like maybe relying on sight? Probably to an extent. I mean, that's where, you know, with golf, I learned how to build that muscle memory, develop it and really train it. So that's how I kind of even came up with the idea that, yeah, this is a consistent snap. I just need to learn how to do it and just replicate that feeling. Um, so, you know, to an extent, yeah, I think so. Um, but really, you know, it's again, finding a way, my way was, Hey, use what my body still has. And that's that muscle memory. That's that ability to produce, you know, a, a similar or identical movement over and over and over again. And, and you, you, you won, um, I, I had it written down somewhere, but like you, you won like a, a kind of a special Olympics in golf or something like that. Um, yeah. So, you know, again, I, I played in a lot of different blind tournaments and I won those, um, this year, the USGA, uh, put on the first ever U S adaptive open. So it was, it was an open championship, like the U S open or the U S women's open or senior opens. Like it's the same, you know, body. Uh, so they put on a, a, a major tournament, um, the U S adaptive open. So it was really cool. There were a bunch of different kind of fields out there, but I think six different fields of different disabilities, but visual impairment was one of them. And, um, that kind of is a obviously broader spectrum, but, I mean, Dan, you, you could be considered one of, uh, you know, like a D3, probably what we call a blind golfer, but I was the only completely blind golfer in the field. Um, so that was a really cool, that was at a uh, Pinehurst in North Carolina. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's just, a, it's amazing. What other, do you play any other sports? Um, surfing, growing up in Huntington, you know, surfer. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, which is, which is cool. People always say, hey, well, I just need someone out there tell me when to start paddling and I make sure it's yeah, the right direction. Go for it. No one looks when they catch a wave, you know, no one's like looking back like, oh, did I catch it? Like, it's all feel. I've got too much of an irrational fear of sharks to go sit on a surfboard. Are you, you, know? you were water, what are you talking about? I mean, look, it, seals aren't, seals, like, we're still afraid of sharks. I mean, we just deal with it. We just like, well, we have to go. So we go. But like, I just don't know how anybody's not afraid of sharks. I mean, it, it's it's just the sharks. And there's, there's a lot of great whites out there. And so... Here's one thing about seal training though, is there's like 50 people in the water at a time. So, you know, it's like a one in 50 chance that if the shark, which is already a low chance, they're going to attack somebody. But if they do, it's like, they'll attack that guy maybe over me. So like surfing, I'm just like, you're just sitting there. You're kind of splashing around a little bit. You, you're looking a little bit like their favorite food. Um, you know, I just, I'm just like, I don't, you know, I, I hear enough about surfers getting, getting, you know, bitten, Right. And I'm like, you know, I don't love, I don't love getting up early in the morning and going into the cold Pacific. So I just never, I never got it. I was like, I don't really know what the point is of this. So I never got into it, even though I think I would enjoy it. I love, I love swimming. I actually love swimming in the ocean. It's one of my favorite things to do is exercise, That's a good thing. <laughs> but the Pacific is a little different because one, yeah. there's definitely great whites out there. Okay? Oh yeah. Like, that's a fact. Oh yeah. I see. Um, two, you can't see anything. So right. Um, I mean, <laughs> you definitely can't see anything, but I'm just <laughs> like, you, you can't even, people who can see can't see anything. And so 
And so I, I, I like, I like swimming in clear water where I can see the bottom and there's no chance of jaws just like coming up from the depths doing that, you know, then just, you're just ending your life that way. I don't know. It, it's, it's a somewhat irrational fear, but I'm like, no, nope, it's not worth it. It doesn't funny. make it any, it's not fun. <laughs> like eighth grade years, probably a year after going blind. Like I, I didn't really grow up afraid of sharks growing up in Huntington, but like a year after I went blind, like there was probably a year or two period where I was so afraid of sharks. Like, I, I don't know where it came from, maybe because I couldn't see and I had, you know, maybe fooled myself that I could at least see the water or something beforehand. Now I couldn't, yeah. like, I was afraid, but um, I just, I don't know what, I didn't really do anything about it. I just kind of like let that fear go at a certain point where I'm like, Hey, if this is the way to go, um, one, it's probably not that bad of a way, like you're in shock and it just kind of happens, but two, like, I mean, it's just your time. Like, I guess, I mean, like if you get, you get killed by a shark, it's your time. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely worse ways to go. I suppose, you know, people will remember you if you get eaten by a shark. That's what I'm saying. Right. Like it's kind of, you know, it's probably pretty cool to, to be able to tell people in heaven. Like, I, I don't want to be the guy in heaven. It's like, how did you die? Like, I, I got a, a coconut to the head while walking under a palm tree. You know, like, yeah. Yeah. That's true. I mean, <laughs> still, still they're scary, man. You're in their zone. You know what I mean? You're in yeah, their zone. I mean, Yep. But in, and and in, in, we do night dives and uh, you know around San Diego and especially when you go start to get near near Point Loma, um, that's where great whites do tend yep. to be in that area potentially. And yeah. you know you're underwater for like three hours at a time. Um, that's a little scary because they'll send dolphins after you. So we have these um, explosive ordnance dolphins that are trained as anti swimmer dolphins and trained to like you know find explosives, do a bunch of things. It's it's they're incredible. Wow. Um, and they'll send them out, to kind of train the dolphins, um, and they'll smack into you in the middle of the night. And it's, it's like terrifying. <laughs> it's you're like, you know, it's, maybe that's just where you're, you're sharks. <laughs> like, I, was I, scared, I mean, that, yeah, it's I might just, be a little more afraid. Yeah. I mean, it's just, they're just, it's just everywhere. Um, uh, <laughs> but that's pretty badass though. I mean, that you can, you're surfing, golfing, play football. It's um it's definitely a good thing when people forget that you even even have the disability. Um and uh you know it's incredible and I think really inspirational. Um I wanna I want you to be able to tell everybody kind of how they can find you, where they can follow you. Oh right, yeah. Um definitely socials are just Jake Olson 61, Olson is O L S O N. Um definitely a little more active on Twitter than I am Instagram, just for kind of obvious reasons. <laughs> um but um definitely you've got a really funny instagram account i mean like you gotta you gotta buy a good content out there don't, don't sell I mean, short yeah I, I i like to have fun one of my favorite quotes in life is if you take life too seriously you'll never make it out alive so um that's it's kind of how uh, i've chosen to, to live my life um and then speaking um so you just kind of alluded to i, I started a, a company called engage basically just try to kind of fix a lot of problems i saw the and, and it's an antiquated field of the speaking business with bureaus and everything. So just kind of create an online platform, um, help make the process real easy. So you just go to letsengage.com. That's letsengage.com. Um, I'll write, I'll be right there. Um, so along with other people, but if you want to search for me, pretty easy and uh, just submit a request. It's about as easy as uh, hopefully you find it easy. If, if not, I'm, I'm doing a bad job with my business. <laughs> oh man. Well, this was a lot of fun. I'm glad we connected. Yes. Congressman, thank you very much.